Good evening, um, or good morning, or good afternoon, depending where you are in the world. Um, just want to say welcome to you all who've joined the webinar so far. Um, it is seven o'clock on the dot in the UK here. Um, so I'm just going to allow um, maybe an extra couple of minutes just to allow more people to come into the room and then we'll make a formal start in about two minutes. But thank you so much for you who've uh, come on time or a little bit uh, in advance of time. So it's great to see you all. Um, so we're just going to allow a couple of minutes to um, uh, see if, uh, if anyone else is filtering in in the next few minutes. Yeah, um, just 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 to let you know that I can see lots of people coming into the room, uh, into the into the Zoom room. So we're just allowing um, for more people to come in before we make a formal start. Um, do feel free to uh, say hello in the chat um, if you want to say uh, where you're calling in from, where you're watching in from this, this evening um, or this morning, this afternoon. I'm, I, we've got a global audience. I think we've got number. Of, we've been promoting this um, uh, with our international friends and partners and so um, um, and we're expecting different people from calling from different parts of the world and across the UK as well so do feel free to say hello on the on the chat and let us know where you are watching this from um yeah I can see the the numbers are still going up so I just wanted to wait an extra minute or so just to uh get as many people in the room as possible before we make a formal start Okay, I think three minutes is a good enough time, right? Um, to let people come into the room. We've got quite a good number now in the room and I think people are still trickling in, but we'll make a start um, because uh, we've got a lot to get through um, in this session. So yeah, a really warm welcome to you all. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, or from wherever you are in the world. Um, and if you're watching this on Catch Up on YouTube, um, welcome to this webinar. So this webinar is called Debt Cancellation, Who Calls the Shots? Um, and this webinar has been jointly organized by Debt Justice, Elasia, Caribbean Policy and Development Center and Debt for Climate. Um, so yeah, like I said earlier, um, um, if you uh, feel free to introduce yourself using the chat function, um, just say where you're tuning in from. It's always nice for us as organizers and speakers to see uh, who's in the room, to see who we're talking to. Um, so my name is Heidi Chow and I am the Executive Director of Debt Justice. We are a UK-based campaigning organisation working to end unjust debt and the poverty and inequality perpetuates in the UK and across the world. Um, we've put on this event because today marks the 70th anniversary of the London Debt Accords. It's an agreement that was reached by leaders of various countries who came to London and agreed to cancel half of Germany's post-war debt. Now, the debt cancellation was a, made a significant contribution to the recovery and stability of the post-war post German economy and helped the country rebuild. And the conditions of the debt cancellation were also favourable to Germany. The deal was swift and it covered all creditors, so no one lender could hold out and profiteer at the expense of ordinary people. 
And debt repayments are also made out of trade surplus. So in other words, from the income that Germany earned from selling exports rather than through more debt. Germany's debt cancellation shows us that debt cancellation can be done when there is a political will. And so we need to join in solidarity with global self activists and campaigners to also demand the same today. Where 54 countries in the global south are in a debt crisis, including countries such as Pakistan, Zambia and Sri Lanka. And these three countries themselves took part in cancelling Germany's debt 70 years ago. So in this webinar, we are going to explore how debt cancellations have been won before and also crucially how debt cancellation can make a difference today and what we can do to support and show solidarity to global south demands for debt cancellation. To unpack all of this, we have a really exciting lineup of speakers. Each speaker plays a crucial role in the global debt movement. And after our four speakers have made their contribution, we're then going to open up the floor to questions and answers. So if you have a question, do post it on the Q&A function. Uh, there should be a button on your Zoom panel for this, and we'll try and get through as many as we can as, 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 as the time will allow. So we're hoping to finish um, this webinar around 7.15 p.m. That's UK time, so roughly an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and just to let you know that we are recording this webinar as well. So you can also uh, share it or watch it and catch up later on. Um, so to kick us off, we have our first speaker, uh, Christina Rabine, who is the political coordinator of Alassia, which is also known as Jubilee Germany, um, and uh, that campaigns for debt relief and systemic changes to the debt system. Christina will be giving us a brief explainer on the London Debt Accords, as well as uh, an overview of other significant debt cancellations. So Christina, I'm really um, glad that you're here this evening. I'm really looking forward to hearing you speak. So I'll just hand over to you now. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. It is really an honor to be here. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. So, um, well, as we just heard, this event today is marked by the 17th anniversary of the so-called London Debt Accord, a very generous debt relief agreement for Germany as an individual country, having been a former aggressor to most of the world back then, um, a debt relief that supported the economic miracle that the country I'm living in experienced afterwards. Actually, the London Debt Accord is not very, or let's say the debt relief is not very well known to be part of this economic miracle. There's lots of knowledge about the Marshall Plan, about these kind of financing, um, but not so much about the debt relief. Now, looking into the invitation text of today's event, it reads, debt cancellation seems like an impossible ask today. But it is not the case that after the London Debt Accord for Germany, there was no other debt cancellation for any other indebted country. There has been lots of other debt restructuring cases, not for Germany, but especially for countries in the global south, be it only with individual creditors, be it coordinated or uncoordinated. So it is not so much that we remind of the London Debt Accord today just because debt was cancelled. Why we send a reminder today, especially to those that decide today about debt cancellation, um, it's rather it's, it's rather because the way this agreement came about and how it was designed, namely that it was not narrow individual financial creditor interests that were the basis for the debt cancellation that Germany received, um, such narrow interests, which usually mean let's not cancel or let's just cancel very little, but uh, let's get kind of back as much uh, of our claims as possible. But it was rather an interest in stabilizing the country politically and economically as quickly as possible. Thus, there was a clear interest, a clear political will to make sure that the way the debt cancellation is designed has the development prospects of the country at its heart. If we look into younger debt restructuring processes and frameworks, including the youngest framework that was established, the so-called G20 Common Framework, all those attempts are and were characterized by an aversion of creditors to recognize losses, right? In almost each and every debt crisis, there's a tendency to treat crisis, at least at the first, as a mere liquidity problem, which would mean, well, we don't need any huge debt cancellation. So it's a, a bit about waiting for better times instead of opting for a quick solution now, even if this means to forego own claims, even if it means that perhaps debt cancellation may be, let's say, too much, if you like. And then as a result, um, what we often had or have is a process of protraction, a process of, a process of too little debt relief, too late debt relief. And then there's a whole consequence of destabilization misery in debtor countries. So we do have in general debt restructurings that are guided by very narrow creditor interests. 
right, by the interest to get as much money back as possible, instead of understanding the debt sustainability of a country in an interest of global stabilization. So what does that mean? The debt cancellation for Germany was designed in a way that guaranteed economic development of the country. So we already heard a little bit from, from Heidi um, about the features of the agreement. First of all, the debt cancellation was generous, right? There was cancellation of half of the pre and post war debt stock and the generous restructuring of the remainder, uh, remainder. But there were other benefits that no indebted state has ever enjoyed since, but which contributed significantly to the success of debt relief for Germany. First of all, Germany negotiated as equal with the creditors, so it could bring in its own interests, uh, right? The parliament back then could make sure that Germany did not make any concessions to creditors at the cost of Germany just to convince them to be part of a deal. Then the resolution of disputes between creditors and the debtor um, by an arbitration court, that was part of the agreement. So in case that any dispute would, would have arise, arisen, then that there would have been an arbitration court with independent judges to make sure this dispute is being resolved. So there was not the sole decision by creditors, let's say, um, there was an independency part, something which really is an issue today. So disputes that exist between, let's say, China as a big creditor today, and then so-called Paris Club creditors, official creditors such as the US, UK and Germany, there are conflicts between them, how they understand that that restructuring should work, um, how they understand how much should be cancelled, and all those all those disputes that block the design of quick and comprehensive debt restructuring processes at the cost of those countries that actually need a quick solution. And no one really wants to move for the other. So trying to resolve them, those disputes, by finding compromises, by bringing in an independent arbiter, is off the table, although debtor countries um, brought this idea in at some point. Um, another feature of the London Debt Accord was the possibility of suspending debt service to individual creditors if they did not allow Germany, Germany to run a trade surplus. So Germany should not use its reserves to service its debt. Heidi just mentioned it. So there was a huge focus on a broader understanding of Germany's future capacity to pay from Germany's future production capacity to the conditions that were needed that Germany can have an export surplus. We will hear on austerity by other speakers, I think, um, but these were conditions that no other country ever enjoyed since, that this was really a condition of the debt relief agreement. Now, of course, we need to understand the political will behind this whole agreement for Germany in the context of the Cold War, in the context of the system competition between the West, the Soviet Union, and that it was super important for um, the um, allies back then to have a kind of shadow case, a, a, a kind of kind of showcase of Western style democracy. And there were other reasons, but this kind of context is of course important to understand the political will behind the agreement. But in the end, what the case of Germany shows is that if political will, for whatever reasons, is there, all sort of things are possible. And there have been other, not many, but some historical examples of far reaching debt treatments that were possible because the political will was there. That was 1969 in Indonesia, where in a very complex situation between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, the enemy, enemy creditors introduced an independent mediator to help them find a good debt treatment. That was 23, a World Security Council resolution to immunize Iraq all revenues against seizure by creditors, something which would be very helpful for today's debt restructurings and would have helped during COVID-2020, but did not happen. And finally, broad debt cancellation for 39 poor countries end of the 1990s until the mid 2000s, including the debt cancellation by multilateral creditors, such as the World Bank, which before that initiative, everyone deemed impossible that the global financial system would break down if multilateral claims would ever be canceled. And then, well, it did not. Um, for the latter, it was not single geopolitical interests that made such innovation possible. It was first the end of a long process of financing the debt crisis, too little too late debt relief, and devastation in debtor countries, which made the subsequent debt cancellation much more expensive for the creditors. And it needed some brave individuals at the World Bank, some realistic governments that took the initiative and said, and designed the unthinkable out of the situation where it was absolutely clear that a solution would have needed 
broad debt cancellation and the inclusion of the multilateral creditors. Um, on the latter, by the way, what also played a role to make that really far reaching was worldwide civic mobilization, right? The Jubilee 2000 campaign that pushed towards debt cancellation for the poorest countries. Now to end, um, if history is any indication in summary, first with political will, far reaching innovative debt cancellation is possible in whatever way thinkable, even if decision makers want to tell you otherwise. Second, there must either be a kind of systemic political interest by political powers to put that sustainability of the country at heart and not one's own narrow creditor interests, um, which, which must not always be um, uh, geopolitical interest of a sort, but could also be global social and financial stability interest. Or three, there must have been a kind of long, expansive and destructive process of delays of too little and too late debt relief at the end, which only brought uh, that, that cancellation remains as an option. And when we look at today's debt crises, we are not yet at the end of this delay process. And the countries we talk about, the Zambias, the Sri Lankas, are not in a systemic political interest. And this, is, this is why we as civil society need to come in and play a role as in the 1990s to make our governments kind of uh, bring in the conditions to cancel the debt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, that was really, really helpful and really clear explanation, sharing with us the key features of the London Debt Accords and showing us that it's not just possible, debt cancellation isn't just possible, but that debt cancellation that actually prioritise the needs of debtor, debtor country um, is, is, is possible, especially where there is political will and the role that we can play to generate that political will um, and generate that pressure. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to move on to Jayati Kush, uh, who's the Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the US. Um, she was also previously at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Uh, Jayati has authored or edited 20 books and sits on a number of international boards, including the UN High Level Advisory Board on Economic and Social Affairs, the World Health Organization Council Economics for, of Health for All, and the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism. She's also a good friend to many social movements across many decades. So I'm really excited, Jati, that you can join us um, this evening and we really look forward to your contribution. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you, Christina, for that really excellent presentation. That was, I think, uh, very clear but comprehensive and you really covered all the essential parts. So that was, uh, that was really excellent. And so I'm happy to be following that. And I just want to emphasize a few things that Christina also mentioned, but maybe I will underline these. That first of all, you know, debt restructuring is actually very standard in capitalism. Capitalist markets have always had debt restructuring, but for private players. So even now as we speak, the, our banking systems in any country we're in, and I don't care which country you're in, I know in, in India, but certainly in the US, in, in Europe, in Africa, there are banks actually not forgiving and explicitly, but restructuring as they call it, debt of typically large corporates. It's happening all the time because it's an essential part of any debt system really, that there will be some debtors who cannot pay and there will be a recognition that there is bad debt. Now, what that bad debt really means, effectively you're writing it off, yeah? And that's restructuring. It's only where you are a sovereign, that is a government, that suddenly all these issues come up, moral hazard, how can we uh, you know, do this? This will just encourage irresponsible borrowing. All of that stuff suddenly starts. Whereas the market system actually enables this kind of restructuring continuously. So I think we have to recognize that, that you know, basically governments are treated very differently by the same uh, creditors quite often who are uh, willing and able to to restructure private debt. The second point I want to make is about, you know, the levels at which a lot of restructuring occurs. Because um, Christina pointed out very well how favorable the terms were for German restructuring. They were incredibly favorable. Uh, and they were, as she also mentioned, they were absolutely critical for the fact that Germany was able to grow itself out of debt. The very fact that the debt uh, servicing payments were limited to 3% of exports, made all of the creditor countries anxious to make help Germany export more. All of this is the opposite of what we're seeing today, where 
in fact, the, the debtor countries are punished in multiple ways. They're, they're facing multiple whammies because not only is the, the credit squeeze on, but then they face higher interest rates and they have to extract that from dwindling foreign exchange revenues. So it's, and then of course, because they cannot spend more and the fiscal austerity is imposed on them, the economy goes into a downswing or gets worse in the downswing. And then it's even harder to repay. So it's really what's going on today with many debtor countries is exactly the opposite of what Germany got. And you're also therefore getting the results that are the opposite of what Germany got in, in terms of being able to grow out of debt rather than squeeze the repayments out of an increasingly impoverished population. Now, here I want to just remind everybody of another historical fact, and it's, it's peculiar that this was something instituted by the British colonial government in India. You know, there were a series of debt crises in India in the colonial uh, period in, before 1945, and there were about three, four debt commissions that the colonial government set up. They had a particular principle. They said all the debt, the, the interest payments together cannot add up to more than the principal. In other words, if you have a debt of, let's say, you know, a uh, 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 thousand, and your all your interest payments add up to a thousand, then you don't have to pay more any more interest. It's a perfectly reasonable criterion for actually debt relief. In other words, that why is this important? Because typically what happens is that when a, a debtor cannot pay, the debt is rescheduled but the interest payments get added on to the principal. And then you're paying interest on that larger amount, larger amount, which is why you find so many countries in debt distress begin with a debt of let's say 50 billion. And then in the process of getting debt relief, they end up with a debt of a hundred billion. Now, how has that happened? It's not because they've suddenly been able to borrow more. It's because all of that inability to repay in a particular period gets added on to the principal. And then, the interest is charged on that larger principle. In, in such situations, you know, very significant parts of debt in many of the debt distressed countries today are not because they were incredibly extravagant all the way through until the very end, but because over the last few years, they've not been able to repay for obvious reasons, for COVID, for climate catastrophes that have hit countries like Pakistan and so on and so forth. And uh, those are added on to principle so that their debt gets larger and larger. This is not just unjust, it's really an inefficient form and something that, as I said, even a colonial administration recognized in the case of India. So what have we got today? We have got, according to the IMF, 62 countries in extreme or moderate debt distress. We have nine countries in open default. We have another 24 or 27 countries in moderate debt distress and about you know, many more on the verge of getting into moderate death distress. In other words, really almost 100 countries with serious problems in terms of external debt concerns. And we have the fact that many low-income countries are now paying more in debt service than they can afford to pay on critical areas like public health and, and, and all. Even during the pandemic, they were paying more on debt service than on public health. Now, this is not just ridiculous, unjust, unfair, terrible, and so on and so forth, but it is pointless because it really means that you're dealing with unpayable debts that will only be a burden on that economy and they will never be able to grow out of that debt. So the solution clearly is to recognize that these are debt levels that are unsustainable and have to be cut. Now, the, the complicating factor today is that we have many more creditors. In the days of you know, the German debt relief, there were dominantly official creditors who made the, uh, who agreed to the change, largely for geopolitical reasons, as Christina mentioned, because of the Cold War. But nonetheless, it was a relatively easy proposition in that sense, because it was governments coming together to agree to cancel half of the debt and allow very, very easy repayment terms for the remaining half. Currently, in all of these debt distressed countries that I'm telling you about, uh, at least half of the problems are actually uh, that, uh, at least half of the debt is on of private creditors. And some of it is banks uh, need lending credit during the period when you know, the world was awash with money. And because of uh, after the global financial crisis, not only was 
all this money at very, very low interest rates, sloshing around the globe looking for places to lend. But also the interest rates were so low and the banks were so anxious that countries were actively encouraged to take on these debts. That's number one. But then, of course, the problem is that a large part of it is also in the bond markets. Once again, this is something that the IMF actively encouraged, the global financial institutions, the Davos crowd. They all said, go out there and, and borrow. This is your moment, you know, very low interest rates. Finally, the bond market is developed in these poor low and middle income countries. There were celebratory scenes. You know, you should have seen the London Economist, the Financial Times, raving about how the bond markets are finally getting developed in these poor countries. So they're all encouraged to take on debt. And of course, as happens when interest rates are really low, governments do that. Sometimes it's spent well, sometimes it's not. But the point is that it really seems like, you know, what's not to, to do when the interest rate is negative in many ways, because there was such low interest rates on offer and because bond markets were so willing to, to rush in and, and enter these new emerging and frontier markets. I'm not saying that governments themselves were not to blame or that they didn't, but the point is that this was really something that was cheered on by the international financial institutions, the ones who are now taking this very aggressive attitude to the debtor countries. And it was something that everyone should have realized that there will be eventual problems of repayment. Now, this, these problems came much faster than everyone expected, okay? They came much faster because, well, of course there was COVID, uh, but we know that thereafter, uh, the recovery, the global recovery hasn't really happened, especially for the Global South, partly because um, many countries, LMICs, were not able to do the kind of fiscal expansion, the massive fiscal stimulus that the rich countries did. And then you have the Ukraine war, which led by the way, I want to emphasize, the war did not lead to rising prices of food and fuel. The profiteering and speculation that resulted around the war led to massive increases in food and fuel prices. So for a period up till about September 2022, there was massive increase in food and fuel prices. They are now back to earlier levels. But meanwhile, many, many low and mid middle income countries have experienced currency depreciations and falling export revenues which has actually destroyed their ability to buy these food, essential food and fuel and cause the prices of these to keep increasing even when the global price is back to pre-war levels. All of these multiple whammies, tourism revenues still affected, remittance revenues still affected, all these sources of foreign exchange have dried up for many countries. And these are not their own fault. These are things that have happened in, in the global economy and and in the world, right, the pandemic and so on, that have forced all of these on them. Then we have countries really facing very severe climate disasters. I mean, Pakistan's floods are only one instance. There are many debt distressed countries that have faced droughts, that have faced declining new kinds of pests that have generated declining agricultural yields, other kinds of major climate, uh, climate shocks and changes that have impacted on their economy which have all affected the capacity to repay. It's very clear now that much of this debt is simply unpayable and has to be restructured, has to be forgiven. I, I just like the word forgiven because we never say debt is forgiven when the private companies get restructured debt, right? It's just taken as normal par for the course. It's never in the headlines even when these corporates get their debt restructured. It's only with the governments that we say, oh yeah, debt forgiveness, and we're being so kind and we're being so benevolent. In the case of Sri Lanka, for example, the bondholders, you know, the ones who are holding out and refusing to even join negotiations and so on, the bondholders have already been paid more than the principal, way back. So the, everything they're getting now is extra. These bondholders, they, they got very high yields because these are seen as risky investments. So they got much higher yields from the very beginning than they would get from any other country. Having taken higher yields because of the greater riskiness and having got more than what they, the double of what they invested, they've got that back. Having got that back, they're now demanding that they be paid in full, that they should have no risk. So you get a higher return because it's riskier, but you will not bear that risk. I mean, 
you know, it's the mind boggles at the injustice of it all, but it also boggles at how markets are extraordinarily inefficient in a rather skewed manner. So what is to be done? I think there's no question that there has to be restructuring. It has to be much faster than is happening now. Uh, the debt suspension, the debt service suspension initiative basically kicked the can down the road. It didn't, you know, it, it did exactly what I was telling you, that it just adds to your problem later on. So you don't pay for a while, but then you have the entire interest thing facing you at the end of that period when you were let off, when your economic conditions haven't improved, when things are still bad for you. But now you have to repay the debt that was postponed for a while. That really has to change. We definitely have to have active, immediate, and much more responsive uh, re response, uh, changes in terms of how we restructure the debt, in which all creditors have to be involved. The private creditors, the public creditors, the governments, and the IFIs, the international financial institutions, who were also actively cheering on all of these policies that led to the disaster that we're in today. So it has to involve everybody. It has to be one, a situation in which the, um, the, the response is rapid. So you know, we should have creditors committees which provide uh, some kind of format within at most six weeks of a request by a debtor country. Instead, what are we getting with the, the common framework that the IMF supposedly suggested and the G20 put, put forward? The common framework for debt restructuring, countries like Chad and Zambia applied nearly three years ago. It's still not resolved. They still haven't got any debt relief. So any country that approaches for debt relief, first of all, it has to be much more rapid. But in any case, to help it make, make it more rapid, there should be a standstill on all debt repayments during the process, because that actually creates an incentive for speed among the creditors. And of course, it does give you some breathing space to the debtors. And currently, this debt uh, relief is available only for middle income, uh, for low income countries. Obviously, it has to be available for countries like Sri Lanka. Uh, other countries that are now in the middle income category. But also what's very important, because so much of the debt is now held by bondholders and they are all over the place and you can always have you know, the rogue bond holdouts who will not uh, go along with the debt restructuring and will sue in some courts and so on. We really need anti-vulture legislation in the major creditor countries. In fact, basically it's, it's London and New York, right? These are the two jurisdictions in which 90% of all of these debt contracts are made. So we really need anti-vulture legislation in London, in the UK, and in the USA, specifically in New York. There is very good news that, in fact, in New York, they are considering such legislation that would force all the private bondholders to comply with the decisions of the majority in the, and engage in debt restructuring accordingly. So. There is hope for this, but it needs much more public pressure, exactly as Christina was saying. It, it's not going to happen because the geopolitics is not exactly in, in, in their favor the way it was for Germany. But it definitely needs huge popular mobilization in the creditor countries to recognize that this is not just a question of being good to someone else and being kind to the poor and you know the way it's presented, but it is essential for the viability of the global economy. And it will, uh, if, we, if we do not provide this debt relief, well, again, I'm using relief, if we do not provide this debt restructuring for sovereign debtors today, we will actually have a much worse global economy in which all of the advanced economies and the people in the advanced economies will suffer because of that pulling down effect of these deeply distressed countries. Not to mention the fact that all of this creates massive inequality, which you know, cannot be fended off by closing borders and, and things like that alone. The kinds of instability that would result, the social and political instabilities that would result are very great. And the dangers are grave, not just globally, but they're grave even for people in the rich countries. So I think it's really important for people citizens of the rich world to recognize this and to put pressure on their governments to opt for this kind of strategy of 
debt reduction, and particularly also for legislation that would prevent the private vulture creditors from impeding such uh, tendencies for debt restructuring. Thanks. Thank you, Jati. Um, as always, um, your contributions are always so powerful and so inspiring and also uh, so informative. Um, and yeah, in particular, thank you so much for highlighting the hypocrisy that we're seeing in the global economy right now. Like you said, the debt recancellations, debt restructurings happens every day for corporations. Um, we see the really reckless lending and lenders having their cake and eating it. They're really charging high interest and they're not taking responsibility when things go wrong. And of course, we're stressing the importance of solidarity and public mobilization. Um, uh, I've also seen some really great comments as well. Lots of people are enjoying um, the contributions. So thank you for your comments and then just, yeah, just sort of that feedback to our speakers, which is fantastic. And uh, just a reminder that we will have a time for a question and answer um, at the, uh, after the fourth speaker has spoken. Um, so do, um, if you've got, if you, if you have to think of any questions, do put them up on the uh, Q&A function um, on the, on your Zoom panel. Um, our next speaker is Joala Rambaran, who is currently a policy advisor for the Caribbean Policy Development Center. Um, and he's also the former governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Joala will be giving us an update um, on the Caribbean debt situation today um, and highlighting the case for reparations. So thank you so much for joining us, Joala, and I'll hand over to you for your contribution. Thank you so much, uh, Heidi. And let me thank again Dep Justice UK for inviting me to be part of this uh, this webinar. And so far, some very informative presentations by my colleagues. Um, I would like to focus on debt reparations, really, from a Caribbean perspective. First, I'll I'll I'll, I'll like to give a historical background between the relationship uh, with Europe and the Caribbean. Then I'll speak about what I consider to be a very interesting story on debt reparations here in the Caribbean that relates to Haiti. And I'll close off you know, with a broad discussion around uh, climate finance and Caribbean countries and the need of the global South. So I think it's important to start with that Britain and Europe were the former colonial masters of the Caribbean. And Britain and e Europe really manage the Caribbean colonies with one singular purpose in mind. And that was to achieve maximum wealth extraction from the Caribbean sugar plantations so that these countries could fund and sustain their own national economic development. Uh, this system as we would as would be called the mercantilist system started with Spain about 400 years ago and was followed then by England, Scotland, France, Netherlands, Portugal, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, with the United States entering a little later on. It's also important to note that both uh, Germany and Switzerland played some roles in the margins of this Caribbean economic system. What is quite interesting is that no part of the world economy in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries generated as much wealth for Britain and Europe as the Caribbean did. Sugar was the most valuable commodity in world trade, and the Caribbean supplied at least 70% of all sugar entering the markets of Britain, Europe, and even the American colonies. And for this, the, the Caribbean was indeed what we would call the hub of empire because it was the primary British center for capital investments, revenue inflows, the markets for manufactured goods, and of course, the development of financial services such as banking and insurance. And for mainland Europe, the Caribbean supported their manufacturing base. So it turned out that the economic benefits accruing to Britain and Europe from its exploitation in the Caribbean were quite extensive, and they formed the basis, of course, for the Industrial Revolution. But while this was happening, the Caribbean itself was being stripped of any backward and forward linkages within that economic supply chain. And when Caribbean countries gained political independence from their 
former British and European colonial masters about six decades ago, they effectively inherited a legacy of underdevelopment. And that was manifested in a range of socioeconomic problems that we know are, are very common to what we would call the small states, the small island developing states, small size concentration on one particular commodity or at least two commodities for export and relatively high unemployment. But I think the most visible and enduring sign of this extraordinary exploitation is the fact that poverty in the Caribbean has been high and intractable. It has become very difficult in the post-independence period for Caribbean governments to really bring poverty down to acceptable levels. And at the time of independence, these former Caribbean colonies severely lacked financial resources and therefore they had little choice but to now borrow from their former colonial masters to fund their post-independence development part. And it turns out that these historical conditions matter because it was Britain and Europe who were calling the shots in, in a sense. And that is what has contributed to the debt situation that the Caribbean is facing today. Today, Caribbean um, countries are among the most heavily indebted among small island developing states. At the end of 2022, the Caribbean's public debt, average public debt stood at 80% of GDP, which is well above the 50 to 60% range that most would consider um, detrimental to growth and development. And even when we disaggregate that, that broad number, we would see that close to about 10 countries in the Caribbean could be considered in debt distress. And as Christina and Professor Ghosh have indicated, this is not a liquidity problem. This is indeed a solvency problem in the Caribbean. Let, let me now talk about um, Haiti, uh, which is in fact a, a member of the, the in Caribbean region. Haiti is a victim of what we would call the greatest heist in history. And it's an, an interesting example of France calling the shots. Um, let me explain why. In 1804, Haiti achieves it, achieved its freedom from France in what was the world's first successful slave revolution. In 1825, however, France with a fleet of heavily armed warships and backed by Britain demanded that Haiti pay compensation to the former French slave owners. In return, Haiti would then receive official recognition as being a nation state. After substantial negotiations, a newly independent Haiti was forced to pay its French slaveholders and their descendants the equivalent of nearly $30 billion in today's dollars. And it took Haiti 122 years to pay off this debt. So here we have a situation where it was the former slaves of Haiti, not the French slaveholders, who were forced to pay reparations for the privilege of being free. And of course, this massive debt at the beginning of Haiti's independence has contributed to severely damaging the ability of this country to prosper and has of course contributed to the climate of instability that has accompanied Haiti in its post-independence history. In fact, in 2010, when an earthquake completely devastated Haiti, a number of scholars and journalists and civil society organizations wrote to then French President Nicolas Sarkozy, demanding that France pay back Haiti. And even in 2020, the French economist Thomas Piketty resurrected this idea that France owes Haiti for debt reparations. But of course, uh, the French government has ignored these demands. And today, Haiti is facing a dire humanitarian crisis. The World Bank estimates that more than half of Haiti's population is living below the poverty line. The World Food Programme 
and the Food and Agriculture Organization rank Haiti at a catastrophic level when we talk about food insecurity. And Haiti's population already suffering from severe malnutrition and food insecurity before the war in Ukraine has faced a surge in global food prices that has worsened the hardships of this already fragile country. So to me, it is clear that global civil so society organization should insist that Haiti's 30 billion debt reparations should form part of the agenda of French President Macron's global summit to develop a new financial pact with the South. Let me turn now to the global north and climate finance. And based on what I've said, there are two really main reasons why global north countries have a moral responsibility to help global south countries, especially those in the Caribbean. The first is that the United Kingdom and Europe committed crimes of humanity against Caribbean nations through the genocide of the indigenous natives through African slavery and through Indian indentureship, right? And international law, both based on the precepts of the International Criminal Court and from the UN Charter recognize that nation states which commit crimes against humanity must make reparations. And reparation is not just an issue of repaying the enormous debt that is owed to the descendants of these victims but it's also a moral and legal obligation. i give you an example, same as we've discussed with we, we, the London Accord. In 1952, Germany agreed to pay over $65 billion in reparations to the Jewish community for the Holocaust. And that is one of the most notable cases in which a country has made reparations for historic injustices. The second major reason why the global north should be assisting the global south countries is that the historical cumulative emissions from the global north spanning from colonialism to the industrial revolution to the present day it is those countries that have contributed the most to the climate crisis right according to information from carbon brief the european union ranks second in the world in terms of its historical contribution to global warming. From 1750 to 2021, the United Kingdom ranks six. Yet, when we look at the landscape, we see that the global north has failed to provide the promised amounts of climate finance to help the global south countries tackle the climate crisis that they've done little to create. And this is particularly relevant for the Caribbean. Caribbean country, countries contribute less than 1% to global warming, but they are the front lines of the climate crisis. And even more relevant is that most of the climate finance that comes to the Caribbean comes in the forms of loans, which of course further aggravates the already unsustainable debt burden of Caribbean countries. And to make matters even worse, Caribbean countries are not even eligible to access the modest amounts of grant-based climate finance that is available because they're considered mid-income countries based on the World Bank's um, use of a per capita income criteria that does not consider vulnerability. Right. So what we see, uh, is a situation where Caribbean countries are caught in this vicious cycle where the financial resources that they need to invest in mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, that is increasingly being diverted to repay debt, while their borrowing costs are likely to increase due to climate-related vulnerabilities. And therefore, our call at the Caribbean Policy Development Center is that sovereign debt and climate justice demands that climate finance be linked to debt relief and forgiveness as a form of climate reparations for the destruction and harm caused by the global North 
countries from colonialism to the Industrial Revolution to the present day. And it's in this context that CPDC has actually developed a model called Caribbean Emancipation 2030, a sovereign debt and climate justice initiative. And the purpose of this initiative is one, to really remove the onerous debt overhang of Caribbean countries, free up those resources to boost climate resilience action, but do it in a manner that is aligned with the 2015 Paris Agreement. And if successful, Caribbean Emancipation 2030 could see the cancellation of at least 30 billion in debt for Caribbean countries. Now, I mean, we, we're also practical and we know that any sovereign debt initiative for the Caribbean must take into account the diversity in their global, in their debt profiles. And Caribbean countries now owe almost half of their external debt to commercial creditors. And, 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 and we already know that in as we, they are the ones who call the shots, uh, as we've seen in Sri Lanka, Zambia, and Pakistan. And in the absence of an orderly debt resolution mechanism at the global level, the presence of the private commercial creditors complicates any sovereign debt restructuring. And finally, within the Caribbean, even when we start to talk about debt restructuring, we now have to take into account China. China has overtaken the traditional Paris Club and is now the most important bilateral creditor in the Caribbean. And I think it's gonna be the country that will call the shots in the future for the Caribbean. Thank you so much. Sorry about that, complete rookie mistake talking um, with the mute on. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Joala, for that contribution. Um, really powerful um, for us to, for, to lay out the intersection between um, debt and colonialism and neocolonialism. And as you, as you said, debt has long been used as a vehicle for domination, control and extraction. And you've really clearly laid out the case for reparations and also highlighting that there can be no climate justice without debt justice. So thank you so much for that contribution. And actually, that leads us quite nicely on to our next speaker, um, Sunny Morgan. Uh, so Sunny is a climate justice activist from South Africa and works with a number of different organizations such as Extinction Rebellion South Africa, the Climate Justice Charter Movement and African Climate Reality Project. He's also the co-convener of Debt for Climate. And I know that Debt for Climate has had a really busy day today. It's been a day of action um, by, de by, by um, Debt for Climate uh, with actions taking place in various locations across the world. Um, so I'm really excited to hear more about um, what's been going on and also to hear your contribution as well, Sunny. I'll hand over to you now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, where am I? Oh, sorry. Uh, let me not make a little bit mistake myself. So thank you very much for this invite to speak to you about um, about debt for climate and to speak to you about, uh, well, my, my views on some of the pressing pressing issues. I want to preface uh, uh, by saying that I don't use the word uh, reparations, nor do I use the words uh, forgiveness or relief. Uh, debt, for, uh, debt for climate is quite clear. And as an activist of over 45 years myself, I'm very, very clear that we are talking about debt cancellation. And debt cancellation in its true sense with no strings attached. And I know it might seem totally, totally unrealistic that we would be able to call for debt cancellation uh, in this current juncture where the world economy is. But I have every uh, belief and I uh, intend to spend my last breath um, working with organizations like yourselves and uh, Debt for Climate to make sure that this is, um, uh, is a reality. And then we can turn the argument on its head because really at the moment we know who calls the shots. It's the World Bank, the IMF, the Black Rocks of the world. But ultimately, I firmly believe that we call the shots. And I'm so happy for the contributions of every single uh, one of the previous speakers because they clearly laid out the technical uh, knowledge that is needed, the historical knowledge that is needed, and the current perspectives. What uh, uh, all the speakers in some way or the other alluded to is that this can only happen um, if civil society 
uh, and a movement coalesces around the demands. And again, a strong word that I use, we are not requesting, we are not asking, we are absolutely demanding uh, the cancellation of the debts of the Global South owed to the World Bank and to the IMF um, against the climate debt of the Global North. And it looks like uh, 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 Joala um, had a sight of my of my mind or my speaking notes because uh, I have one constant that I uh, that I refer to when people say, "Well, why do you think the global north owes?" I say the global north owes because of slavery, because of colonialism, and because of extractivism. And I speak in the context uh, of Africa. Um, of course, when we say we make a demand for the cancellation of all the debt of the Global South, we include the Global South as it's identified, uh, the entire Global South and all indigenous uh, 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 peoples around the world, whether they reside in the Global North geographically. Um, but if they were colonized, if their cultures were, 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 um, were damaged, were raped, were extracted from them, if, uh, if there was the influence of the power brokers uh, in old colonialism or new colonialism, that we include them in our definition of the global south of vulnerable people around the world. So this idea that the global uh, north owes this climate debt, uh, it can never repay that climate debt. Um, it brought tears to my eyes when I, and I've heard the story a number of times when I <coughs> hear the story of Haiti and this inconsistency that uh, France still perpetuates and perpetrates against uh, Haiti. And it's absolutely correct that it's uh, foremost in our minds when we talk about uh, debt cancellation. It certainly must, the money must be returned. But in the context of why we think in debt for climate, the Global North owes, we are unashamedly uh, uh, put forward this, this, this idea that it's debt, uh, it's a debt that is owed, they can probably never re be repaid. And even if all the climate, if, even if all the financial debt of the Global South is cancelled, it would not still make a debt for 500 years of abuse, whether that was through extractivism, to slavery or to colonialism. Of course, uh, today is um, a day uh, it's been uh, uh, commemorated, it's an anniversary, it's been remembered, it's been referred to in whatever context uh, because of uh, uh, the London Agreement and, uh, um, and the, and the uh, relief that uh, Germany that Germany got. I am from South Africa and uh, uh, um, from Johannesburg, but I'm in Europe at the moment. I, I'm talking to you from uh, Berlin. Today, we, um, we protested outside uh, the finance ministry. Um, we wanted to uh, hold uh, Christian Lindner's uh, feet um, to the fire. Um, the disrespect showed to the, the, the activists today, indicative of uh, the disrespect showed to the global north uh, for centuries. Um, our, our call and our demand is for the cancellation uh, without any conditions. And we do this and we think uh, that it's only possible to achieve this uh, through movement building. Um, our role is to talk uh, in Germany today, but there were actions in Johannesburg, in Kampala, in Uganda, in Rwanda, in Tanzania, um, maybe about 10 African countries, um, and maybe about uh, another 10 or 15 uh, European countries, uh, bringing this uh, uh, message to all and sundry, working in collaboration, as I'm talking to uh, Dead Justice now, with the Extinction Rebellion, with Scientist Rebellion, will be in London in uh, two or three days, and then off to Zurich uh, to talk to um, organizations that Debt for Climate met during the Davos protest, uh, when we occupied or, uh, um, yeah, when we took action at, uh, at the private uh, airport to prevent the jets from landing or from taking off. So, this idea is to is to do the movement building. You know, it's uh, totally surprising to me that even when we talk to um, when we talk to people who are like reasonably well educated, well read, that they had never uh, known this idea uh, that the London Agreement existed, and that uh, that Germany's debt was cancelled, or fifty percent of it was cancelled. When we tell them countries like Zambia, Pakistan, and South Africa then the Union of South Africa, because the Republic wasn't in existence yet, um, contributed and signed agreements that uh, that uh, supported uh, uh, German debt cancellation. Uh, they can't get uh, wrap their, their, their heads around that notion. And today, 
we hold Germany responsible for standing in the way of legitimate debt cancellation for uh, 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 for Zambia. Um, this year, in uh, a month or two ago, uh, in conversation with um, with uh, um, one of the Green Party representatives, uh, a member of parliament, uh, indicated to us over a Zoom call that uh, Germany was re-establishing uh, a new was establishing a new strategy in how they deal with Africa and the global South, cognizant of its historic uh, uh, position and of its colonialist past. And this is, uh, uh, we need to hold them accountable for that. Not only Germany, we want to hold accountable uh, all uh, multinational corporations that assisted either in the in the perpetuation of, uh, of, of, of slavery, the perpetuation of, uh, of colonialism and extractivism. Um, for instance, organizations, uh, German uh, organizations were party to the support for, uh, for the uh, apartheid regime in, uh, in, in, in South Africa and continuously uh, perpetuates these injustices. So the, the strategy that Debt for Climate wants to uh, work with is to build solidarity. We fully are fully aware that that solidarity will mean nothing uh, if we don't center uh, the struggles at the worker level. So one of our deep strategic objectives is to work with uh, union movements around the world, on the ground, in Latin America, in Africa, um, and, uh, and in Asia, to make sure that they understand and are conscientized to the plight of workers around the world, because that is how we think we can, we can we can uh, we can win this. Uh, I liked how the other uh, speaker said that. Well, it's, uh, debt cancellation is not a new thing. It's been done before. Uh, it's been done as recently as uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, when the most indebted nations had some of their uh, 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 um, debt cancelled or renegotiated. We we want to understand this and we want to build those uh, solidarities with worker formations. Hence, we will be uh, uh, um, undertaking work uh, together in formation with. Uh, planning some uh, some of these events together with the uh, CADTF who are going to do the counter uh, uh, summit in um, in October we want to be uh, in the forefront of the discussions what's different i think with all of the debt cancellation movements before is is i think there's a sense of urgency and the connection that um, that uh, debt for climate makes with the climate crisis and uh, its ability to hold uh, 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 these governments uh, and multinational corporations accountable. I think we have what we what what was lacking in previous um, in previous movements, uh, as successful as they were uh, in in popularizing the notion, is the fact that we have this idea now of social involvement and specifically the involvement of young people. Young people want to know where their clothes are made. They want to know where their food is grown, and they want to know uh, 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 what their positions in it and are they uh, contributing to making the world uh, a better place. And and they ask this thing not superficially. They ask this question very deeply. Um, and I think millennials are, are key to the to the discussion and to and, and to the uh, achievement of uh, debt cancellation. Um, I think what needs to happen is is this idea that uh, uh, and the previous speakers have said. It's not. Uh, we we are not appealing to the benevolent nature of uh, of, of of corporations or of governments or of uh, uh, institutional lenders. We are making this demand because there is an injustice that exists, and that injustice uh, is uh, the value extraction uh, from the global south to the global north. Um, for me and for uh, activists in uh, debt for climate. Uh, we want to be bold, we have to be bold, we need to make this demand in a way that uh, connects with, uh, with, uh, with taxpayers, with citizens, with workers in the, in, the in the global north. People have spoken to us today across uh, many of our activities, and, and it's, a, it's still obviously a relatively new movement, um, is um, they feel guilty and how, how, how uh, that they, they they live in with privilege, they live in uh, in uh, a relative wealth and splendor, and they feel guilty about that. They want to know that uh, 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 they want to come to the aid of the global south. They want to um, they want to do their relevant work. But we we don't want people to feel sorry for us. We don't want people to feel that they are doing us a favor. We are literally making this demand, and we want to do that very very boldly. And I think that this movement has that potential if it continues to collaborate with uh, all levels 
whether it's through the class structure, through the worker structure, or, or, or through the financial structure. And I think that uh, I certainly believe that uh, it's achievable because uh, because we can grow uh, uh, faster than movements in the past simply because of social media and because the ur of the urgency. And I think that a specific moment is coalescing uh, on the planet. Um, uh, and we must take advantage of that. I, I'm hopeful that we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll be successful. I'm encouraged by the growth of the movement and I'm encouraged by the urgency with which people speak about uh, debt cancellation. The article in The Guardian yesterday, um, uh, is putting, is putting uh, debt cancellation uh, on the front pages of newspapers, uh, credible newspapers in my mind. Uh, people like Jason Deacon be beginning to talk about uh, debt cancellation and having this conversation with debt justice now, I think is the start of a, of, uh, of a new phase in the, in, in, in the debt cancellation narrative. I think uh, we all need to do uh, what we can, but uh, collaboration is going to be key to that struggle. South Africa, for instance, owes uh, the World Bank and the IMF 250 billion US dollars in local currency. It's almost 5 trillion. Uh, that excludes um, what we refer to in South Africa as state-owned enterprises. That, this is the state directly that owes that money, but state-owned enterprises like the National Utility, the National Water Board, um, and the education system, they owe another uh, bunch of money. Today, South Africa, the largest economy on the African continent. Some people think it's Nigeria and uh, 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 whether it's Nigeria, whether we're number one or number two. We are now, as we speak, uh, in uh, 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 power outages, euphemistically called load shedding in South Africa. And it hovers between eight and 10 hours a day for the biggest economy on the, on the, on the continent. And it's, it, it does that because the national utility owes the World Bank 400 billion uh, rand, which is about 50, uh, about 50 billion uh, US dollars that we will never be able to pay. Uh, we are reinforcing the CDA, C, uh, ADTM's notion of odious debt and a, a second largest worker union in the country now getting behind the call to say that the utility can only um, survive if, uh, if its debt is cancelled because there's no way it can even serve the basic needs. South Africa spends 50% of its time um, in darkness uh, without any power for the economy. We lose about 1 billion rand a day, which is the equivalent of about uh, 50, million, uh, 50 million US dollars, 55 million US dollars every single day because of power outages. Um, and this is the second largest or first largest uh, uh, economy uh, on the African continent. It's uh, it's mind boggling that we've come to the stage. It's because we can't service the debt that we owe the World Bank and the IMF. And once the unions begin to make that call, that's the turning point because then the connection between odious debt, the cancellation of the debt and the survivability of a premier nation on the continent is at stake. And I think that uh, that is a wake up call for all of us. Thank you. I've done, it. I've done it again. Okay. No worries. No worries. Um, I was just saying thank you for your contribution and for your reminder that even though this evening we're talking a lot about debt cancellation for Global South uh, sovereign debt, actually, we also need to remember that it's the Global North that owes a debt to the Global South. Um, and also, yeah, it's been really interesting hearing about your reflections on um, the, the, the movement and also your work around building um, solidarity uh, with workers in terms of growing the, the, the global um, debt movement. So really thank you for your contributions. Um, we've got about um, six minutes um, to try and tackle some questions. Um, I've, uh, there's a, there was a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of questions on the q and I'm going to ask them together. Um, so it'd be good if um, maybe Jati, they were kind of directed at you. So I'll probably ask you to go first. And then if anyone else wants to contribute after you, then we can hear other people's responses to the same two questions. Um, but the question, um, if you, I, I don't know if you can, as speakers, whether you can also see the Q&A, just see if you want to read along, you can. Oh, that's great. So the first question was from Kathy Allen. Um, I guess she wanted to know a bit more about the vultures that you mentioned to Jati earlier on. Um, and 
whether you could explain a bit more about these creditors um, and are they com uh, are they companies? Are they easy to find? Are they easy to target? And then the second question from Colin McCulloch, um, uh, it's connected. Um, it's talking a bit more about kind of looking at the underlying system. So um, there is, in addition to a, a global South debt crisis, there's also a debt a crisis amongst private households in certainly in wealthy wealthy economies um but trying to build trying to find the connection between the two and the question he's asking is is there a fundamental problem um, around the financialized extractive uh, extractivist capitalism itself um, and the role of private banks that create loans to extract interest for their owners and investors who are rich citizens of rich countries so how can you um how can this be unwound is the question so if you could make a response to both of those questions and then i'll ask if anyone else wants to as well sure i mean very very big questions okay about the private bondholders and and vulture funds and i think there's also a question from alan keenan which is uh, related to this so I, I want to emphasize Christina's point that, you know, it's not really only about vulture funds. Vulture funds are specifically those funds that buy up distressed assets with a view to maximizing the return from them. So they buy at much, much lower prices. It can be bonds, it can be anything. And then they try and extract the maximum that they can from them. So they are particularly aggressive in, in trying to get repayment. But a large number of other bondholders have are also uh, increasingly resistant to any kind of restructuring. In the case of Sri Lanka, we do know there was one, I think it's, it's Hamilton something, Hamilton Reserve Bank uh, actually has sued uh, Sri Lanka for the debt that it's owed about 40, 480 million or something like that to demand the full value of that, uh, of those bonds, uh, of its, uh, um, the value of its bonds. But uh, there are indications that in the, debt in the ongoing debt restructuring process and the IMF talks, the continuing IMF negotiations with Sri Lanka, several of the bondholders are, as they put it, playing hardball, re really refusing to participate in it and holding out for full repayment. It's true that the Sri Lankan debt is trading at a significant discount in the secondary markets, but that does not prevent the same bondholders from saying, well, we are going to demand our full repayment. And this uh, is something that would be at least assisted if these are, if they are bondholders from New York, from uh, who did the contract in New York, then they would be necessarily part of any restructuring effort uh, if the New York legislation goes through. But obviously a similar legislation must be done in London, which has even a larger number of uh, sovereign debt contracts. So the other question is a much bigger and more profound one. Yes, absolutely. The massive increase in debt indebtedness of not just sovereigns, but particularly households, students, and so on, is very much a reflection of not just financialization, but why do we have financialization? It's because there isn't public provision. I mean, let's face it, what happened in the United States in the 1990s and then again in the 2000s is that workers didn't get wage increases. Instead, they got credit. During periods of economic boom, the, the median wage in the US remained stagnant, did not increase, or in some cases even declined in certain years. However, consumption grew, and that's because these workers were not, uh, who did not get higher wages, were in, despite higher productivity, were instead encouraged to take on credit. And of course, that blew up on, in two cases. One was the whole, you know, the 2001 recession because of the Enron scandal and so on. And then, of course, the subprime housing crisis, uh, where again it exploded. But then, what happened after that? Two years of sort of you know calming everybody down, and then once again, households are encouraged to take on debt. Students cannot get education without taking on debt. To me, that also is a travesty. And we've seen the the huge disasters that student debt can wreak on an economy. Uh, in the Chilean case, where in fact the government was forced to step in and guarantee all these debts just to enable both the students and the educational institutions to survive. So it's the financialization is occurring because public provision is withdrawing, which is a deeper phenomenon of late capitalism. This need to privatize everything, because as you cause income inequalities to increase more and more, you face a real crisis of consumption people don't have the money to keep spending on things. And therefore the only thing you can do 
is to force them to consume a whole range of services that were earlier publicly provided and at lower prices. So this is not just in the US or in advanced economies. This is a tendency everywhere. In my own country, India, this is a growing tendency. Now 70% of tertiary education is privatized and, and people are selling land, going into debt and so on to actually educate their children, even in a situation where they're not going to get jobs thereafter. So yes, this is a, the, the explosion of debt, domestic debt, is very much a reflection of a broader process of privatization in which finance has stepped in as the intermediary and therefore becomes not just the agent that gets uh, you know, a cut of the private provision of a service, but also encourages further and further, shall we say, um, <laughs> the next derivative of all of these so that you can then bundle them up into securities and sell them, which has happened happening again big time, just as it was doing before the financial crisis and similar kinds of tendencies. I'm talking far too much. Let me stop here. Sorry, Heidi. That's okay. Um, I feel like we've got some, we've got um, quite a few questions and I think a lot of these questions could warrant a whole, you know, 10 minutes or whatever on their own. So I do feel a bit guilty having to truncate some of these answers as well. But um, we have, like I said, we've got quite a few questions in the chat and I'm also conscious we're running out of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, read out four questions in one go and then each speaker can have two minutes and choose which which question you want to answer. I think that's probably the, um, the best way to try and get through as many questions as possible, as well as allow the speakers to respond to the questions that they um, have uh, most connection with. Is that okay? So um, the questions that we have on the Q&A, um, so there's a question about, um, from Martin, Matthew Martin, sorry, um, to get permanent change, we really need citizens to get angry. So how, what's the best way to do this? How do we get people really angry? That's the one question. Question two, um, if, we, uh, if we were to get reparations or debt cancellation, debt restructuring agreed, how do we ensure it reaches the people who most need it? That's question two. Um, question three is a question, quite a big question actually. It's about uh, what do the panelists consider the potential of building something along the lines of a non-aligned movement? Um, and um, uh, and that yeah, building solidarity, uh, which would help the issue of debt repudiation as a powerful way to force the issue within the global north. Um, there's uh, that's question three, um, and then question four um, is unpayable debt to private lenders a valuable financialized asset, and then question five. Um, uh, with regards to structure of debts becoming more and more from the private sector as bondholders, how do we convince the private sector to join us and, agree and to call for debt cancellation? So there are five questions covering five slightly different angles. Um, I'll, I'll call each, each speaker in turn to respond to the question or questions that you would like to respond to. Um, I'll go, I'll go, I'll start with Christina and then we'll uh, go, then we'll go to Joala, Sonny and then back to Jati at the end. Okay, so Christina, do you want to take whichever question you would like to <laughs> respond to in about a couple of minutes? Thank you very much. Um, it's really um, super valuable questions and so many and so diverse ones. Maybe let me start with the letter um, and again give some historical context. So when looking, so the question was about how to convince private creditors to participate in debt cancellation. Well, I mean, it's not that private creditors never um, participated in debt cancellations in the past. Um, in general, I think what we definitely need to understand is that private creditors do not, do not have a development mandate. They don't have an economic stability mandate, a kind of global order mandate. This is what our official governments have. So like um, in many cases, especially when there are no structures, there's no sovereign debt workout mechanism, there may be um, official sector bailouts available. It's in, in many times just not in their interest to cancel debt. So um, the question is always who's responsible and there is a huge responsibility with official governments that they bring the conditions that are the incentives that private creditors want to and, and will participate and when looking into the past especially when it comes to major debt crises it was actually official sector incentives that convinced private creditors more or less forced them to participate there was the brady plan um, in the 80s that was official mm -hmm. sector incentives actually making sure private creditors participated if we look into the end of the 90s the hippic so for the poorest 39 poorest countries, the debt cancellation that existed there, there were no similar incentives in the case in, in, in the sense of that um, private creditors were incentivized or forced to participate till today. 
um, commercial creditor participation was actually um, not very high. Still today, the IMF in, st in statistical updates is saying, well, we tried to persuade them um, with moral arguments, but it didn't help. So this is the kind of um, like, let's say the best way is giving the right incentives. Um, um, actually, uh, when we, we were just talking about anti vulture and anti-holdout national legislation in the UK, there is a law that exists for HIPAA countries to make sure that private creditors can more or less not sue HIPAA countries. Um, and that was effective because after the introduction of this of this law, there were actually more or less no 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 lawsuits anymore. So this kind of incentives are needed. And then maybe just reacting to the question of uh, whether unpaid, unpaid debt is a valuable asset. I think that speaks a little bit into this whole discussion. Um, well, it is if there's a chance that others will give concessions and you with your, your asset, you actually don't have to give concessions. And we saw this in many, many debt situations in many debt crises that there is official sector money. That's actually what we see right now in the COVID debt crisis. There's lots of my official multilateral money, rescue money that goes into countries because they are in need of cash. And that's of course also used to kind of pay um, already unsustainable debt, um, not only from private creditors, of course, but also from private creditors. So there are countries where we see where flows are net negative. So where countries repaid the private creditor, but there were uh, no new funding to those countries. So in that sense, well, I mean, it is valuable as long as you can actually um, bet on someone is going to pay and give the concessions. And then in the end, you're going to be repaid in full. And that's as, as said, given that we are lacking structures and lacking uh, incentives, it's actually um, what happens in many debt crises. Maybe I stop here and give the other panelists the chance for the other questions. Thank you, Christina. That's fantastic. Thank you for trying to get through as many questions as you can there. Um, can I pass to Joala um, if you would like to answer yeah, whichever question you, you, you would like to answer in about a couple of minutes? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, just uh, briefly in terms of reparations and how those reparations would be used if um, if they were obtained. Uh, within the Caribbean, there's actually a what we would call the CARICOM Commission on Reparations, which is a, a regional uh, body that has been charged by the governments to, um, to deal with the whole notion of reparations. And that um, body has actually put forward a 10-point plan. And part of that plan speaks to using the funds to finance uh, education, health, and other critical social areas. So within the Caribbean, there's there's already the shaping up of you know a, a sense of where funds would go if um, if reparations were made. And on the climate side, there's also the notion that the funding of the loss and damage uh, finance facility must be seen as a form of climate reparations then. And therefore, it would be seen as helping Caribbean countries to, to recover from the damages caused by hurricanes. And, and that, that's a substantial um, uh, number in terms of loss and damage over the almost over a century. Um, that's the, and the next point I just want to um, just kind of raise is the, you, we keep talking really around also around um, official official sector debt, but also remember the private sector also has debt, and that is something that came to the fore during the Asian financial crisis, where there were a number of uh, private conglomerates who were able to unduly influence the state, and that state capture came to be known as crony capitalism, uh, and this was really manifested more in in Korea. And during the height of the Asian financial crisis, um, even the, the ministers of finance and central bank governors were unaware of what was the true extent of the debt problem facing them because it did not include the debt um, that came from the private sector. So I think that's something and all that we need to, to, to deal with when we start to talk around the whole notion of um, debt transparency. Thank you, Joala. Um, Sunny, do you want to uh, make an attempt at any of those questions that I read out earlier? 
like three of the uh, of the questions um, and um, very interesting. So, uh, how do we get people angry? Uh, I don't think it's really a, a, to my mind it's the wrong question for this reason. We saw uh, with the block blockades of of roads in the UK and and in Germany, the wrong people get angry um and 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 they take out uh, uh, their violence uh, and their frustrations on fellow citizens so i think and i know it may come across sounding like naive and uh, ill thought of but i want to ask the question is how do we make people more compassionate how do we make them more compassionate to care about what's happening to uh, the people in the global south so we must tell the narrative we must create the narrative about what's happening in the global south in relation to the security, the, sa the safety, and the privilege of those in the in, in in the global north. And I think once we start highlighting that, I don't like uh, uh, the poverty porn of uh, the Ethiopian hunger crisis of 30 or 25 years ago, but it had some value um, is is in making uh, in making uh, the connection between compassion um, and action. So I, I think that's probably a, a, a better way of framing it. Um, the other question we get often in debt for climate is, uh, so if the debts are cancelled, then um, how do you prevent uh, the country from taking on new debt? Or how do you, um, how do you uh, ensure that the money is used uh, for purposes that it was needed? Um, I always <clears throat> say, we, we're taking on the global elites by calling for debt cancellation. We're taking on one of the most, uh, 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 the hardest things to accomplish. And in that, we're also moving society forward. So uh, I, I foresee that when debt cancellation happens, and I have no doubt that it will, um, that we will see um, the emergence of strong civil, civil society uh, organizations and certainly people who uh, operate in, in the case of South Africa in a participatory democracy, which is what our constitution says we are, and we give credence to that by creating a mechanism where civil society or citizens have a meaningful democratic role to play uh, to act as the as perhaps as the sentries or centurions or or, or, or guardians of the process. And I also again think uh, to some people it seems airy fairy and wishy washy, but because we're taking on this big task uh, and taking on the global elites, we're also moving society forward and making it, uh, make, making sure that people have a way to participate in the process. And one of the easiest things we could do with the savings is to pay a universal income grant. Uh, it's it's uh, it's long overdue that every citizen must be guaranteed some sort of uh, uh, fund or fee that allows them to live above the poverty line. Um, and then the last question is really really great because it's a strategy of uh, debt for climate. So I, I I do believe that as a non uh, we must promote the idea of uh, something along the the, 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 the lines of the law and movement. We always say, what happens if 50 countries got together and just refused to pay the debt? Uh, they could they could, they could could wield some power. But if you get the right mix of the 50 countries, some of the most indebted nations um, have some of the most valuable resources required to power the fourth industrial revolution, um, like copper and uh, lithium and, um, and, uh, and um, cobalt, uh, and the stuff that is in our cell phones. So if those countries were part of a, a consortia uh, that says to the global north, we're not paying this, we'll stop the fourth four industrial revolution dead in its tracks. Uh, and I think we must be able to understand the social capital, the social capital that we have and the power that we can wield if we organize ourselves and rid of ourselves, obviously, of uh, the corrupt uh, 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 leaders in our midst that collude collude uh, with these agents of the global of, of the global north uh, to perpetuate uh, slavery and uh, what I refer to as the a modern form of colonialism. Um, and one of our activists uh, in the UK, Rob Callender, always uh, say uh, says this. He says debt uh, is the knee on the neck of the global south, and we need to be able to show that we can break that hold uh, and that chokehold and remove the uh, the knee from the neck of the global south. And we do that through collaboration. But I don't think our countries have realized the strength that they have uh, and how we can build that authority. Uh, 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 we need to we need to uh, wake them up to that uh, realization. I, I think I'll stop there for the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Sonny. That was really great and um, really inspiring for us um, to keep going on the fight because, uh, yeah, it's a long road ahead, but we, we're going to keep at it. Um, Jati, do you want to take a, a, a minute 
to just respond to one of those five questions <laughs> you know it's uh, it's i think all of the uh, all of the panelists have given terrific answers and i don't want to uh, add much more to anyone's time i actually just want to respond to something that um is it uh, alan keenan has put in the chat about how what do we do i mean yes we, i recognize odious debt but how do we ensure that this doesn't just give impunity to the same corrupt leaders and this is, of course, a question that is constantly coming up in Sri Lanka and in many other countries. I, I just want to remind everybody, that, you know, this debt that is taken on, it takes two hands to clap, right? These are creditors who knew exactly what was happening. And the point is that it's not, you can put in conditions. You can say, well, I'm lending to the following specific project rather than to, in general, a bond, an international sovereign bond in a country where I know that the government is illegitimate, corrupt, doing X and Y, allowing illicit, illicit financial flows, and so on. These are choices made by creditors, including private creditors. But let's face it, the IMF was cheering them on. The last IMF loan before the, this one in Sri Lanka was in 2016, when all of this was in full swing. And everybody knew that these sovereign bonds were being utilized by a particular family and their cronies. So it, it really is a question of joint culpability, I would say. And therefore, I don't see this as a, I, I take the, completely the point that we don't have to call it forgiveness. It's not a question of forgiveness. It is a recognition of your own culpability. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Jayati. And um, yeah, I just, I just wanna say that I really would love this discussion to carry on a bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, but it's getting late in the evening here in the UK and probably for you have also spent a good amount of time with us um, on this session today. So just really thank you to our speakers. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. I certainly um, feel like I've learned so much, but also feel really inspired um, from all your contributions. And I can see from the uh, questions that we've had, but also the chat and the, the conversation on the chat that um, we've had a really um, engaging um, discussion that tonight. Um, so if you want to read a bit more about the German Debt Council, we've published a long read on our website and Zach my colleague has put a link to that in the chat um, she's also shared a link to join our email list so that you can receive the latest updates and actions from us and to keep um, updated with all the latest developments around um, the global south debt crisis so thank you once again everyone for joining us today and I really hope that you have enjoy the rest of your evening or your daytime and um, thanks a lot bye everyone bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Keep in touch. <laughs>